I want to welcome everybody to tonight's webinar. My name is Mark Varian. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Research Institute at Crow Canyon, going on my 33rd year of working at Crow Canyon. Um, really grateful for all of you who have joined the webinar tonight. The, the uh, title of the presentation is Fioge, a classic period Tewa community in New Mexico, and the presentation is by Patrick Cruz. I want to thank people who have made this possible. Uh, there's a couple of Crow Canyon staff members, Dylan Schwint and Taylor Hasbrook, who handle the logistics and the technology for making this possible. And also want to acknowledge that funding has been provided by Colorado Humanities, the National Endowment for Humanities, and the Region 9 Economic Development District of Colorado as a part of the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security, or CARES Act. Uh, economic Stabilization Plan of 2020. Very grateful for that, uh, that allows us to do this webinar series. So on the uh, technology end, y'all are all probably Zoom experts by now, but I wanted to let you know that you can uh, move the talking heads. I think you'll be seeing a split screen with the presentation on one side and the uh, speaker on the other side. So you can minimize the size of the speaker so you can maximize the size of the presentation by floating over that dividing line between them and dragging that to the right and minimizing the speaker window. We'll take questions and the best way to do that is through the Q&A button that you'll see on, the, on your screen. We'll keep track of all those questions and try and, and get to them at the end of the talk. Um, if you're having any difficulties with Zoom, you can also live stream this talk at that address uh, on Crow Canyon's Facebook page. And if you wanna go back and review the talk or if you have to leave early or anything like that, we publish these webinars on Crow Canyon's uh, YouTube site and you see the address for that there. Um, most of you probably know about Crow Canyon, although some of you might not. We're located uh, just outside of Cortez, Colorado, in the southwest corner of the state. Uh, we're a nonprofit, uh, and we're going on our 38th year, I think, uh, this year. And our mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. I really encourage you to check out our website. It's excellent. A lot of material on there, including all of our research, many educational tools. Uh, this is, by the way, a picture of our campus in the background with uh, the beautiful Sleeping Ute Mountain uh, behind it. The Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo Ute and Diné people on whose traditional homelands we work and reside. We're grateful to all indigenous people who continue to preserve and protect cultural traditions, maintain ancestral relationships, and steward these lands. We're doing webinars every Thursday at four o'clock. And next week, uh, the presentation is gonna be how prevalent was ancestral Pueblo garden hunting, a test using stable isotopes and rabbit remains by Jonathan Dombrowski. Jonathan is a PhD candidate at the University of New Mexico, a former Crow Canyon intern and a former Crow Canyon employee. And I can tell you, he gives a great talk. His visuals are great and he's a really engaging speaker. The talk uh, two weeks from now is the Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society uh, co-presenting that. Uh, uh, and it's Barger Gulch, a Folsom campsite in the Rocky Mountains by Dr. Todd Soroval. I think I said that wrong. Um, so really looking forward to that, too, to learn about some of the earliest settlements in North America. This is a slide that shows you the, the places where you can contact to provide support for the indigenous nations of the Four Corners uh, to help them meet the challenges they're facing as a part of the pandemic. Um, all of these are good organizations. And if you don't have something to write these uh, web addresses down with, this, that's a good thing 
where you can go to the YouTube site, find this talk, and find this slide will show up there, and you can get these addresses from there. But all of these are really worthwhile organizations for providing support uh, for these nations as they cope with the coronavirus. Oops, I'm sorry. All right, that's my introduction. Uh, the title of our talk again is Fioge, a classic period Tewa community in New Mexico. And it's by Patrick Cruz, who's a member of the OK Owinge Pueblo Indian Nation. Patrick is currently pursuing a PhD in anthropology with an archeology span focus at the University of Colorado Boulder. His research interests focus on Southwest archeology span and more specifically, the P3 migration out of the Four Corners then the post-migration period in the northern Rio Grande. He also focuses on the formation of social and cultural identities, on the Tewa language, on village and community formation, indigenous archaeology, and phenomenology. His recent graduate work was conducted on the Cuyamungue site at Pohaki Pueblo, and his current dissertation research focuses on a site near Okeowinge called Fioge. Previously, he has 20 years of experience, both working in archaeology and in the museum fields, including working at Bandelier National Monument, New Mexico History Museum, and the Center of Southwest Studies at Fort Lewis College. Um, Patrick, we're really grateful for you doing this uh, webinar tonight, and I'm very excited to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to stop my screen and turn it over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you. That's an awesome introduction. Um, I will see about sharing the screen. Let's see. So I don't know why mine didn't go away. Taylor. I just stopped your screen share, so you should be able to now, Patrick. Okay, thanks. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, hold on. That's right there. Is that up? Yes, we can see it now. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so the site that you know we'll be looking at tonight is called Fioge, Fioge Owinge. Um, a little bit about me. Um, so yeah, I've I've uh, I've gone in, into archaeology sort of a, a roundabout way, starting in in the, basically working with the Park Service, then going into museums. And now getting into archaeology, um, but all of it is, has been related uh, to uh, Pueblo and, and more specifically Tewa history. Um, I want to do a, a quick shout out to to Bandelier just because that's kind of where I got my start. Uh, they invited Pueblo youth at the time to to come in and work alongside the uh, park uh, the park uh, reps, the uh, the archaeologists with the park. Um, and also uh, archaeology field schools and whatnot. So that's where I got to, to work sort of in the periphery and kind of see how things really, you know, happened and what archaeologists were interested in. So that's, that's what got me into to working in, uh, in this field. And then also just that I've, I've also had a side gig of uh, doing uh, uh, pottery, making pottery. Um, I, I, well, before, before getting into the program, I was also selling pottery. But I was interested in uh, the, I guess, the old style of making pottery and uh, also uh, what things taste like when they're cooked in pottery. So um, um, I guess you could call that uh, 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 experimental archaeology. So let's see. Let me, no, let me move this little window down so I can see this. Okay. So, yeah, so Fioge Owinge, um, the site is LA 144. Uh, so it's, it's, this is kind of a, my interest in the site, is, it's, it's sort of a broad look. It's, so you have the site itself, you have a broader look at the agricultural fields, and then a broader look beyond that to the landscape. Uh, one of the things that a lot of uh, Pueblo elders have mentioned is that archaeologists spend too much time looking down and not looking at the broader landscape and the horizons. And you really need to understand all of those aspects to understand the situation with the village, why the village is there, and to understand the context. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to do that with, with this analysis. 
So this is, uh, I did my first summer work there and I'm going to do uh, another summer next uh, next summer. But um, I've also run into some issues. So uh, like everyone else, we're having to deal with coronavirus or COVID. And just to get an idea of where we're at, uh, map of New Mexico, we can see Fioge north of Santa Fe. So that's where, why is my... Sorry, the uh, the uh, PowerPoint's taking over, so I will go with that. So why is a study important? Let me back this up just a little. So basically, one thing about Fioge is that it takes place right at the cusp of Oñate, Spanish uh, uh, exploration in New Mexico. So that's kind of the time period when it crosses the gap from pre-contact to post-contact. Uh, another point about it is that um, it hasn't garnered, the area that Fioge is in hasn't garnered a lot of attention by academics and scholars. Um, uh, there's another area next to it, uh, the Tewa Basin, that's had quite a bit of analysis uh, work been uh, done. Different field schools have gone in, uh, but this area hasn't so much. So that makes it different. Um, and then just that uh, Harrington recorded quite a bit of the area, recording a number of different sites that uh, not all of them have been located. Uh, so part of my, my analysis or my study has been to try to maybe document some of these sites or try to look for some of these other locations because they do relate to Fioge in the broader context. Patrick, uh, real quick, I got a question. Uh, who is yeah. Harrington? Oh, uh, Harrington, came, he was a, uh, an ethnologist, kind of a trader. He, he came in in what, the, the 1900s. Uh, his study, he did a, a pretty grand study of the Pueblos um, about 1915, 1916. He published his book anyways in 1916 of a, a study of just a survey of all of the different Pueblos along the Rio Grande. And he included maps and uh, quite a bit of work there. So that's, he also did a lot of recording of, of native names for places. So that was different too. So that's actually been a, a treasure trove. So yeah, very important. Um, J.P. Harrington. And so let's see. Uh, and also there's uh, implications uh, for Fioge and it also, likely connects to the Arizona Tewa as well in that storyline. So, so Fioge itself, uh, the site is Fioge Owinge, which means basically the red flicker village. And so we have an image of a red flicker right there. And um, the site is connected to Oke Owinge. The, the site of Fioge was likely contemporary with, uh, with Oke Owinge itself, which is, you know, as we know is, uh, formerly San Juan Pueblo, um, but it is ancestral to Oke Wenge because when Fioge was abandoned, a large number of the population, when they left, they moved into Oke Wenge. So there is a, an ancestral connection to that site. Um, the, the rest of the population, uh, according to story, moved on to, to Arizona. We'll also look briefly at uh, at your work, Mark, just a real quick glimpse of your catchment analysis applied here. And also to, um, let's see, there's a question on the dating of Fioge as to especially when it was abandoned. And um, there's about a hundred year gap right in that historic period when the site was abandoned, but it seems like there should be more record to it. So that's kind of one of the things I wanted to look at um, if we could narrow down about the time that it was abandoned. Uh, let's see. Some, some interesting points I wanted to mention too is that part of my analysis is to look into the agriculture, agricultural practices of Fioge. And I was interested in the question of irrigation, especially irrigation. Uh, it plays such an important role in that area right now. And um, uh, that seems to be the main attraction for occupation in that area, especially later on. So it seemed like likely that irrigation should have played a part 
at the formation of villages at pre-contact. So uh, that's one of the things I'm trying to explore right now with this. So let's see. Some perspectives that I'm, I've been keeping in mind when I've been doing my work. So a little bit of this. Um, so with the, uh, the catchment systems that uh, Mark, you came up with, uh, I hope I'm going to present this uh, correctly. <laughs> um, but you, essentially, there's a three-tier system. And what you did was you applied this three-tier system to Mesa Verde. Uh, I'm applying it here to Fioge. Uh, and this is a, a tiered system that represents distances out from a community. And it really is mostly it's related to resource uh, 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 gathering, essentially. How far do people go to gather certain resources and how does that affect or, or have an impact on the, the social aspect of a community? Uh, what I'm interested in is that two kilometer aspect because that seems to be the defining point where people have face to face contact uh, with each other that seems to be surrounding a community, sort of as a defining point of a community. And uh, it should not overlap with other communities. So, and that's that blue circle around Fioge. I'm also, I've also been thinking about Marchetti's constant, uh, just this idea I, that people generally on average will commute or travel about 30 minutes outside of their community. As far as distances are concerned, it's about 30 minutes. That doesn't seem to be, this seems to be pretty universal. Uh, it's, it's now with modern commuting, it seems to have been the case in the past. It's not subject to technology. So whether you're traveling on foot, on horseback, buggy, you know, car, 30 minutes seems on average to be what people would most likely travel. And if you do on foot, uh, it comes out to about 30 minutes, comes out to about two, two and a half kilometers or so, which I think uh, complements the, uh, the first catchment of two kilometers pretty well. So I think they're pretty complementary to each other. So other background, um, let's see. So the area has been explored quite a bit, but there has not been any excavation work at the site. Um, most recently, we've had uh, Carpenter and, and Marshall Walt have gone through. But the first recordings of, of uh, and then this is, this is Harrington's book here in the corner uh, of his analysis work that he did in 1916. And... The first real recording seems to have been from Castaño de Sosa. Uh, he was an expedition that came in ahead of Oñate, and he records the site of Fioge. And the way that he had written the uh, the record seems to indicate that it was a community that was still there. Um, what's interesting about that is that then you have in 1598 Oñate arrives and he settles at uh, San Juan. And uh, not only maybe uh, maybe about three or four um, miles or so from, hold on, sorry, only about three or four miles from uh, from Fioge, and yet despite that, he doesn't seem to really indicate that Fioge is a living community. There doesn't seem to be any real record of it. Uh, it does show up on the maps without a name, and um, there's no record of a church being placed there. There's no record of a priest going out there to administer to the people of Yoga. Uh, it does not get renamed with a Spanish saint name. So it seems that the community has simply fallen off at this point. And so one of the questions then is, has the community already uh, dispersed by this time period? So 1590, it was there. 1598, there's not really a mention. So that's one of the, the questions because this relates to when was the site abandoned? There's other people that have uh, suggested that perhaps the site was, was abandoned. Maybe if you relate it to the story of the Tewa migrations to Hopi, people might suggest perhaps like the, the end of the revolt. And that would be 1690s. Uh, so there's a hundred year gap difference. So that was one of the interesting things about that little mystery I find interesting. Um, so this is, this is some of the stuff that 
like Harrington recorded quite a bit of information, ethnographic information about Fioge. And this is the kind of maps that he had created. And so I was trying to apply these maps to the real world. And uh, that wasn't always the easiest case, um, but you can see what I was kind of working with. Um, so here we have Fioge, and then we have the Tewa Bay. Well, this is the valley that Fioge is in. I've been referring to this as the Velarde Valley, but it doesn't really have a name. Um, but one of my questions is that this other area is the Tewa Basin. This has been really well studied, and but it's been studied, I think, in isolation from the this other section of valley that Fioge is in. And so that kind of makes Fioge in that area interesting because they're contemporary uh, with each other, but there's they're, they've been looked at sort of in isolation from each other, but they're obviously had to have had a uh, connection, especially since they were occupied at the same time. So uh, so that's one of the other questions. What was the relationship between these two regions? So we're getting closer to the site here. Uh, the yellow is the uh, is demarcating the site itself, and it's owned by the uh, by Okiawinge itself. Um, the uh, the property, of course, across from it is San Luceros, which is state property, and we have private property on the other three sides. And we have also found that the the site does extend far beyond the uh, the borders, the boundaries of the site. Um, into property, private property areas on, on three sides. So you can kind of make out um, sort of the outline of a, uh, a plaza, room blocks outline in a plaza. And the site is located on a terrace. And west of the terrace is pretty much flat, uh, irrigable land all the way to the Rio Grande. And this was a map that uh, HP uh, Mira had created in the 30s. And so Mira had gone through, did a lot of mapping at the time and uh, hit just about every site I think that he could find and drew maps of all these different sites. This is in comparison to what uh, I and my advisor, Scott Ortman, had come up with. And there's a little bit, so you can see sort of the comparison and we can do a close up. So that's a close up. So we have room blocks, we have two likely kivas, we have a couple of plazas and you can kind of see more of the terrain and uh, you can see how it overlooks the uh, irrigation land to the, the west. So, and you can see how far it extends beyond the boundary of the, the site. So uh, yeah, let's see. The site has been impacted by uh, uh, some adobe, uh, some people in the past who have collected adobe muds in the area, um, but let's see. This is so. This is an image looking towards the south, and we can see the Hamas Mountains in the background. And here again, we can see the plaza. Just to kind of give you an idea of where we're at. Oops. Here we go. So you can kind of see we're at that star, and we're looking south. And uh, and so what you see that this tiny little plaza here is what we're looking at here, and uh, it's a it's a pretty obvious plaza location. It's um it's nice and flat and what is otherwise a pretty rocky terrain. The house in the far uh, corner there uh, does occupy part of the uh, the site lands, and um, there's a room block up in there. So like I said, the site does extend in three directions. Um, uh, let's see. So, but uh, but the bulk of it seems to still be intact. Here I am. This is a little bit of cut through here, and this is a uh, this part of the soil is, is cut through what is a uh, uh, a room. So there is a, and unfortunately you can't really make it out here, but there is a room in here that you have a floor, um, adobe floor present, and uh, you can also kind of get uh, see the terrain. A little bit because you can kind of see that it's it's pretty um, a little bit of rough it's a little rough and then you also have like uh, an arroyo forming in one side um, there have been issues of dumping and whatnot in the area let's see 
And here I am in the same plaza, but on a different, on the Eastern room block area, there is an exposed room here. You can also see an alignment of stones right in here that is likely probably the top of a wall. And um, what I'm looking at is this. So we have what is basically a, a, a wall that's protruding out um, the sandstone uh, uh, building stones. And uh, so that's that's what I'm looking at in that other photo. So the the, the village looks to have had maybe on um, maybe about 300 to maybe just less than 300 rooms, depending on uh, if it's uh, first floor, second floor, uh, that kind of thing, uh, or first story, second story. So uh, that's what we're thinking at the moment. And then looking west, we can see Mesa Prieta in the background, uh, also called Black Mesa. Uh, below it is the Rio Grande. And you can see that the, uh, the leaves are, are changing colors. And I found that even though I was supposed to do work in June and uh, in July, uh, I did a lot of this work much later. I think it was in September. And uh, it actually, it's perfect time to go because it's not as hot. So... Uh, so down below by the uh, where those trees are, you do have uh, Los Luceros property. And this is basically the area that any irrigation that could have taken place, I mean, that's that's where it would have been, is on this property. So I would have to include Los Luceros. Um, like I said, it's, it's uh, state land. Um, there's a lot of irrigation that is currently done in this place. Uh, the site itself, I think, dates to the 1700s. Um, uh, there's a when Hispanic folks moved into the area and occupied it. Uh, there is currently an, uh, an acequia running through the property, a very major one. And we do have evidence for, I mean, modern uh, irrigation and laterals that feed the current uh, apple field and apple orchards. So. If they were doing irrigation farming, this is where they would have been doing it. The question is, do those, if those irrigation fields exist or irrigation uh, canals exist, uh, would they still be preserved? And if they were preserved, would they still, you know, were they incorporated into later irrigation systems? So that's kind of one of the things I've, I've been thinking about uh, in my work. Also, we, we did do a ceramic uh, study. And uh, what we came up with is, uh, and these are kind of, these are more or less, these are painted bowls or, or decorated bowls, but these are more or less in chronological order. So you can see that uh, most of the occupation, the bulk of it uh, took place between Biscuit A, Biscuit B, and Sankui uh, style, which basically is like 95% of all the pottery that we tallied came from from these three sets so when you think about chronology what we're looking at i i think is somewhere around hmm, 1325 ish or so all the way to maybe 1625 as as where basically 95 percent of the ceramics is coming from there's of course, earlier examples and later examples, but those are more along the lines of, of trace uh, 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 examples of ceramics. So this seems to be when the bulk of occupation took place at the site. Um, so when we're talking about irrigation um, and applying the idea of ir irrigation fields to the two kilometer catchment system. Um, basically what I did was I created the circle here around Fioge and the white here represents all the irrigation lands uh, that, that could have been used uh, within that two kilometers. Obviously the Rio Grande runs through there and you're, uh, that would have to be taken out of this. Uh, but in any case, uh, if if Fioge did have irrigation farming, um, of course that's the question is if, but if they did, uh, it would have had the maximum potential from basically being very comparable uh, to to Okio Winge uh, was at in the 1890s, and we do have good records for uh, for what that looked like. Um, that's been studied by a number of archaeologists. Uh, 
Um, some of the most prominent, I think, would be by uh, by Richard Ford, who who did a, a big study on on the agricultural practices and uh, in quite detail at Okewinge. So they were probably very comparable to each other. Now, I do have to mention that um, again, the the question of irrigation. Uh, it can be a little bit of contra controversial in this sense because we do know that irrigation was taking place off of tributaries, off of streams where the water was more manageable. And a lot of people have suggested that they would not have been irrigating directly off of the Rio Grande because that would have been a little more difficult for the technology of the time. Um, so that, that's something to consider. Um, there was also uh, uh, there's also a number of agricultural fields, dry farming fields that are six kilometers plus east of, of Fioge. So they they were also farming out in the distance. But how important those fields were in relation to Fioge, you know, that still has to be understood. Um, but, you know, this is kind of the thing is it's kind of where archaeology is is about testing you know uh, a hypothesis and and if it doesn't pan out it doesn't pan out but at least we still further the field of an understanding um but it's still a question that i'm interested in so that's that's why i'm pursuing it uh to what end we'll see and again so basically we have fioge and los luceros and here we have two irrigation ditches going through the area. Uh, these are the uh, two acequias. Um, one of the, the, the questions I had was, were these acequias, uh, these two in particular, uh, present when the, the uh, area was occupied by the Spanish? Or what did the Spanish actually uh, excavate these out themselves? Um, so pre-contact, post-contact question. So one of the things I was thinking about is that if these were pre-contact, it would make sense um, that uh, any any Hispanic settlers would simply uh, continue using the same ditches um, that that were already there. And we can also notice on the on this top slide here, we do have a irrigation headgate in this area. I'll, I'll, that's going to become important here in a, a second. So um, so we have an image, a LIDAR image here, just the, just the, here's Fioge again. And these are those two irrigation ditches. What you can see through this is that the area has an extensive network of, of ditches, laterals, and whatnot uh, feeding the entire area. Um, so again, one of my questions being that are some of these, or can we find any that might be, uh, older than, than, the uh, initial occupation by, by Spanish, uh, uh, colonists. We do see this interesting area up here. Uh, it has water that's coming out of springs that are feeding into the Rio Grande. So there's also a potential that we might actually have irrigation coming out of this area too. Um, let's see. And so there's another site. So we can't separate Fioge from other sites. Uh, we have to keep things within context. Uh, there's another site called Sashu Owinge uh, that's north of Fioge that is um, – a contemporary of Fioge, even though they were sort of an inversion of, of occupation histories. But we can see Fioge in the center. We can see where Sashu is. If And these blue lines, these blue circles, represent the two kilometer catchments again. So again, these are the limits of what a community likely, what spatially defines a community. Um, and then we have Yunge down below. So uh, they do seem to fit in that sense. These are the irrigation headgates. So we have a headgate, a current headgate within the region of Sashu Owinge. We do have another headgate, uh, the one we were just looking at um, across from Fioge. And then we have one more headgate here that goes down into Española. 
Oh, you have been signed up because you are currently signed in. Uh, hold on. I have. Are you guys, am I still there? Yep. You're still here. Okay, I got like a Zoom meeting thing that's telling me to sign in. Do you guys see that? Nope. Okay. You don't, just, but you should just be able to minimize it and continue on. I'll just minimize it, just making sure. So, yeah, so you have this two kilometer catchment with a head gate, two kilometer catchment with a head gate. And then one of the questions then is this big empty space is also a perfect two kilometers uh, in any direction. So it seems like this is sort of a potential catchment as well. Um, there's no known site in this specific spot, but it uh, it does fit the landscape, you know, and it does seem to have a head gate um, as well associated with it. So again, that brings into the question of, of there was at least one site um, that Harrington wasn't able to locate called Popovia Winge. Um, so that might be a place to look. Uh, also, we do have Okeowinge, the current village here. You can tell that the uh, Okeowinge overlaps the catchment with Yunge. So these are likely a single community. Uh, and that's what we know of from, from the, the village uh, oral stories. They were two different villages, but one community. Uh, but we do know that uh, from oral stories, Okeowinge came from this direction. Uh, there were two other versions of Okeowinge that had been abandoned along the Rio Grande. Um, so maybe there's a question of whether or not that has anything to do with this empty catchment system that's currently there. So, so that's that's kind of what I've been looking at. Um, like I said, this is the second, no, this is the first summer, and then I have one more summer to work on uh, for collecting data. I'm also interested in how petroglyphs may play a role in uh, irrigation head gates as basically signaling the presence of a of a head gate. Um, so that's something I'm going to be exploring for next next uh, spring and summer. Um, and then let's see, I I also wanted to mention that one of the, <coughs> excuse me one of the important things about Fioge is this idea of not only is it ancestral to Oke Winge, but according to oral stories at Oke Winge, that uh, a large number of people who left Fioge moved to to the Hopi uh, uh, Hopi lands, and may have been part of the group that helped to establish Tewa Village on First Mesa. Maybe um, there looks to have been probably multiple uh, Tewa migrations out there. And so one of the questions again is when did people if they when did they leave Fioge as part of that migration to Arizona? And in what relationship does that have to the arrival of the Spanish? Um, if Yogi was, was abandoned around 1600, right as this, uh, Onyate shows up, did Yogi have to, you know, was the abandonment part of the, in relationship to that? Um, if you take it as the, the standard story that we understand, uh, at least from, that's widely understood about the arrival of Tewa peoples into Hopi was that they were Southern Tewa folks coming in uh, from a village called Zawadi um, after having been invited to Hopi, to move to Hopi. Um, Spanish documents do record the uh, uh, Zawadi uh, in existence prior to the revolt. And then after the revolt, it seems to have been abandoned. And so you can date that uh, just from the historical documents. So that would suggest Taylor folks are moving out to Hopi somewhere around 1690s. Um, but it, this seems to post date Fioge being abandoned. So there, there's at least two, a case that, you know, basically you could have two Taylor migrations taking place, uh, perhaps more, but at least two taking place out to Hopi. So there's, there's interest in that. 
Um, and so, uh, yeah. And uh, so this gentleman, Albert Yava, uh, does mention, you know, he's a Hopi Tewa. Uh, he did talk about, in, in at least uh, uh, some of his interviews, uh, of Tewa people coming in from uh, the Rio Grande, but identifying as Northern Tewa and not Southern Tewa. So there's there's that whole thing there, again, confirming that there were probably more than one Tewa migration to Hopi. Um, but I don't think, what's interesting about that is I don't think that's widely understood. Um, most folks, I think, would understand the, the traditional narrative being uh, in scholarship being that there was a migration. Uh, so anyways, um, that's really my discussion. Oh, I wanted to mention just this one photo here. This was on one uh, one person's private property. We have a fence line that moves right along the uh, in the same direction as a foundation of a room block. So you definitely have uh, uh, this, the area is still used. People are still living there in these places. Um, uh, so I, don't, I just find that interesting and fascinating. So uh, that's that's it for my talk. So I'm sorry, my, my screen was, uh, I think the slides were timed for some reason this time around. So they were moving on me without me want, making them do so. <laughs> so I apologize for that. So No need to apologize, Patrick. That was a really excellent uh, presentation. Um, and we're really looking forward to seeing how your research develops. Um, there are some questions coming in from the audience. Um, some of them are, uh, s some of your colleagues, um, and I got there. The first one is wondering if the dating of irrigation systems would have an effect on historic and current water adjudications since prior appropriation is so important to, uh, water rights hierarchy. So what would, if you can demonstrate that, um, these predate the Spanish, what would the implications be for water adjudication? Uh, it's very true that um, there could be, there could be some legal uh, ramifications for, because uh, the thing is all of these communities are tied to the same irrigation ditches. Uh, the one that goes through Okeowinge, for example, runs, you know, basically from south of Los Luceros, uh, all the way through Espanola down to like the southern section of Espanola where it finally dissipates. Um, and all the folks that are living along those, the, that ditch is, um, they're all farming it. So they're, they're all tied into the same system. Uh, so there are definitely potential for problems if you think about like water rights, who has access to how much water, uh, for fields. So that could always be a problem. Um, but uh, it seems to me, though, that most of these communities that are tied in with an irrigation ditch, they cooperate with each other. They cooperate with each other because they, they need the same water for irrigating their farms. They basically cooperate with, with helping to clean the ditches. Um, when do the ditches open? Uh, you know, there's only one head gate. And so it all depends uh, collectively on when that head gate is going to be opened or closed. Uh, so there's a, there is a lot of cooperation there, but uh, you do ask a question that there you know there is the potential for for problems of course. So we got a question of could lidar pick up evidence of irrigation canals, and I assume that means um, irrigate really old irrigation canals that might not still be in use. I totally think it could. Uh, the question is being on the ground and actually verifying, uh, making the distinction between a canal that even even the smaller, uh, uh, like the offshoots, can they're almost so minimal that you could almost mistake them as being old or something, and and it turns out that they're still in use. Um, so even just something like size isn't really a, a good indicator. Um, but you can definitely use LIDAR to, to locate these different canals, but it would take having to prove them on the ground. And uh, 
uh, yeah, so definitely, definitely a, a positive thing for LIDAR, yeah. Well, you're lucky to work in an area that's had a lot of uh, research done on agriculture. And a lot of that, as you know, is by um, Professor Ford. And we got the question, how does Dr. Ford's research on agriculture tie into your research? Uh, for one thing, he sort of gives an example. I mean, an example of Oke Winge is not very far from, from Pioge. And at this point in time, Oke Winge without a doubt is irrigating, doing irrigation farming. So it gives a sort of a, a base to, to uh, a, a sort of a baseline to test and to compare Fioge with, uh, with the assumption that Fioge was uh, being used or were actually using irrigation farming. So it gives us a baseline. Uh, but he also mentions and, you know, discussions on dry farming and whatnot. So again, all of this lo is looking at irrigation farming, but we ha can't forget that there was a broader context. There were there was there were agricultural lands uh, that were dry farmed to the east too. So that's something to always keep in, in mind. So it so wasn't all eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. You mentioned dry farming. Is that different than uh, gravel mulch fields, or is that what you're referring to when you say dry farming? That's what I'm referring to. I mean, to me, dry farming is sort of the catch-all phrase for anything that's like that. But yeah, it's it's gravel mulch fields, uh, basically uh, farm farming that was off around six, seven kilometers to the east. That were taking uh, these fields are basically on hills and taking advantage of hilltops and slopes and catching the rain and funneling rain into crops. And the the mulching, the gravel acts as a mulch to keep the water in. So they were they were doing that too. Now one of the questions is what kind of uh, crops were they uh, uh, growing in these fields? And so that's that's one of the other questions. So, so what kind were they? <laughs> I know that some some folks have been studying uh, this and have suggested that cotton might have been one of the things that they were growing in here. Uh, I don't know if a study has been done in these specific fields to see if there's any pollen or anything that suggests cotton, but that's that's always been one of the suggestions, uh, which is always interesting because, you know, the, the standard thought has always been that perhaps we're too far north for cotton production, but at least around places like Kuyumunge, um, it, it seems that plausible, very plausible that cotton was being grown in these places. Very interesting. Somebody asked, can you look for variations in soil density or linear uh, distributions of plants according to the soil that might be a key? I think he mean, I think this question means, could that be a way to locate uh, ancient irrigation features? No, definitely. Um, so of course, with anyone that's ever dealt with irrigation farming, we understand that these ditches get um, reworked, revamped, recleaned, Several of them have been had sections cemented over so that they don't have to be cleaned every year. But generally, they've been cleaned every single year by by cleaning parties, essentially, uh, and and reworked and maintained. So there's a lot of changes that have happened uh, to any of these ditches, uh, especially the main acequias. Uh, and so the closer you get to a headgate, it's likely the more repaired and impacted that these kind of activities have happened. So that's not where you're going to be looking for, for any evidence. You're going to be looking for um, channels that have been abandoned and haven't been in use for quite a long time, that haven't been reworked, haven't been uh, maintained for quite a long time. And uh, that's where we would look for those kind of soil samples that haven't been impacted. Yeah. Um. Somebody uh, said that they thought they saw parallel lines on the line stir, stir slide. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. And they wonder if they were seeing things. So um, uh, maybe later you can go back to that and we can get back to this person. Yeah, well, uh, the, uh, the LIDAR was showing, uh, certainly showing current uh, irrigation systems. Uh, and hopefully, you know, um, hopefully some ancient ones as well. But certainly there's so many different irrigation systems that are present in the area. So you probably were seeing quite a bit of that. Thanks. Um, your uh, 
chair is tuned into this webinar and Scott says, thanks Patrick, with an exclamation mark. Since Okeo Wenge and Yunge have overlapping catchments, I was thinking that maybe the original OK lies in that gap. What do you think? Question mark. That has been something that I have wondered quite a bit. Uh, there are two other iterations of OK Wenge that happened prior to where it currently sits, and both of them are north of, of current location of OK Wenge in the direction of that gap. Um, there seems to have been uh, uh, well, Dr. Ford has shown me where uh, he thinks that two of those sites are, and I, they are closer to where OK Wenge is today, and Harrington they're kind of going off of where Harrington also thought they were. They're also very close to where Okewinge currently is. Um, so they're not quite in that gap, but uh, I, I wonder if there is a community or re remnants of a village of some sort there. Uh, again, the maybe the hard part is A, it's, it's private area, property area. B, uh, a lot of these were adobe sites. Um, and Harrington did record that at least for one of the uh, previous OK Winge uh, iterations, uh, that it had been, it, the community ended essentially because the site was flooded out and washed out. And uh, according to Harrington, he visited the site and there was, in his mind, nothing left to really show that there was a site other than uh, shirt scatters. Mm -hmm. So it could be difficult, but maybe LIDAR or something else can maybe help with us trying to determine that. Somebody asked if you have pictures of head gates and then they asked, how do they operate? Um, so the head gates today are extensive units because they're coming right off the river. And so they have been, instead of, uh, and I don't have a photo, I'm, I apologize, but um, they've been so extensively worked and then having to deal with flooding and, and whatnot. And of course the river now is more controlled than it was in the past. So it's more predictable. Uh, but today the answer has been to simply cement it and put in a lot of heavy stones into that area. And so that's sort of making it more of a permanent structure. Um, and then they have metal gates to basically open and close these. Uh, what irrigation head gates in the past probably were, was basically um, a channel of dirt, and then you had logs and stones that were simply applied to close the gate when not in use. So, yeah. So I have a question that probably just uh, reflects my ignorance of irrigation systems, but the canal systems of the Hohokam featured gigantic canals, like a person standing in the bottom of one, the top of the canal would have been over their head. So is the, is the Rio Grande really that much more technologically different than the, uh, the, the streams and rivers that the Hohokam were irrigating from in the Phoenix Basin? I would not imagine that to be the case. So that definitely, to me, is suggestive that, I mean, it could be done. Yeah. It certainly could be done. Um, so, and again, I do think that one of the attractions to this area is the irrigation potential. And you add that to this idea that these communities are dispersed out of regular distances from each other along the, the stream, the river. To me, it is at least suggestive of some sort of networked irrigation shared community kind of thing going on. Um, but again, it's just whether or not uh, we do find evidence for it though. I noticed on one of your slides, it mentioned uh, some dating techniques where you actually might be able to date the irrigation canals. Do you think there's any hope for that? Uh, I'm hopeful. Again, it, it, all of it is, uh, is dependent on finding a older abandoned channel that is, uh, you know, hasn't been used for, for maybe centuries, a couple centuries. If we, can, if we can start to locate something like that downstream uh, from, from, the he, from the head gates, from the river itself, I think that we could finally maybe have the opportunity to test some of this out for some sort of soil analysis, yes. Somebody wrote in and suggested uh, perhaps using infrared aerial photography at different seasons to try and locate this canal that would be so important to your research. 
Mm -hmm. Well, we do have some uh, questions about the migration too. And your friend and my friend and my colleague here at Crow Canyon, Tim Wilcox asked, what about migration to the Denata? And can you tell people what the Denata is? And Whoa. Um, the Denata is an, an area that's out by Gaina. I, I'm hoping I get this right. <laughs> yeah, you're um, on it. And so it's an area that I think there's, there's Pueblitos out there. There's evidence that uh, Navajo occupation in this area, but it may have been a place of contact with Athabascan folks and Pueblo folks. And so there may have been a bit of mixing of, of culture in that sense there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's basically, I mean, it has implications for Navajo uh, uh, culture, I think, in that case. Um, yeah, that's that's all I I mean, it's really not my area of study, but I think I think you're trying to catch me. <laughs> uh -huh. no doubt. Well, it is uh, this, the the uh, production of gobernador polychrome pottery is the focus of Tim's dissertation, and he's doing a Crow Canyon webinar in 2021. So stay mm -hmm. tuned for that. Um, Charlie asks if the Hopi names that end with Tewa, of which there are many, um, mm -hmm. are those uh Tewa descendants or does the Tewa name have both Hopi Tewa and Hopi Hopi you know I'm I'm gonna have to claim ignorance on this because I don't know from a Hopi perspective uh what you know Tewa tacked onto some of the the indigenous Hopi words and names really means it might actually have a meaning in Hopi uh distinct from from Tewa culture I don't know I really don't know I think you're lucky that uh, Hopi has such, you know, it has one of the um, premier indigenous archaeology programs in the nation. And I've been privileged to work with that department. Uh, Stuart Koyumpti was the mm -hmm. current uh, uh, manager of that program. And I've been on First Mesa with folks, elders, and it seems to me like they talked about distinct uh, Tewa migrations more than one. But I, I wasn't sure I was understanding it right. But um, mm -hmm. I hope you're able to connect with the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office and, you know, do some do some uh, work with them on that topic. I think it would be very productive. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting because if you look into the uh, the scholarship right now and what has been written uh, about the topic, it, it seems like what's really out there right now is this idea of a Tewa migration from the southern Tewa regions, which are like basically the Galisteo, south of, of Santa Fe, those kind of areas coming into to, uh, the Hopi mesas uh, by being invited. Um, and and these, uh, this idea that they did so probably post uh, Pueblo Revolt. And so it's, it's not like it's, you know, secret information or anything like they go, oh, there's, there's multiple uh, migrations that could have taken place or anything. It's just, I don't think it's just, it's out there. But I do think, I mean, at least from Okiawinge, uh, it's acknowledged that um, there's a northern section or, or group that went out there. And I, I do understand that Hopi acknowledges multiple groups to come in. So not just a single table migration. Interesting. Um, it disappeared. I was going to read it. Uh, Kelly Hayes Gilpin had uh, written in, but it went away. And um, oh. But she she wrote in bailing us out on the Tewa uh, question on names um, and said that Peter Whiteley has an article about that and that it's a pan Pueblo male honorific, if I remember the, the message oh, right. No. But the thing to do would be to check out uh, Peter's uh, publication on that. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to close with one more observation and question for you. And that is, from my perspective, one of the most important and maybe the most important development in Southwest archaeology during the time of my career is the emergence of indigenous archaeology. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about what indigenous archaeology means to you and uh, why you think, if you think it's important, and if so, why do you think it's important? Yeah, so I think it, it's hugely important. 
Um, I guess what I consider it to be is it's archaeology that is done. Uh, first of all, it's done by indigenous folks, but it's 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 done with an indigenous perspective uh, pe- by people that have had have grown up in uh, uh, communities that have have grown up sort of thinking about things differently and and thinking about these places not as necessarily as material cultural sites uh but as living spaces ancestral places places where people actually were there and so they they do bring something different to the table i think that uh can inform on these sites uh differently than than say traditional archaeology can do Plus, you have the added benefit, I think, of adding um, a human aspect to it that I think is oftentimes missing and and um, one that's more respectful, I think. So I hope that that kind of helps to understand that. Um, you know, I think it's it's definitely. Yeah. I was going to say it's different than, say, some of the archaeology that, say, is done, say, in in Europe or other places where at least in the Americas, archaeology tends to be or has been in the past one where uh, people, I guess, you have the colonial experience and whatnot that has taken place where archaeology was about studying other people and studying rather than your own past, it's other people studying that kind of thing. And I think that at least with with, uh, indigenous archaeology, uh, you have more of a maturing of the field, I guess, and more, yeah, just basically archaeology as a field growing up to be more inclusive. Well, I think it uh, has, yeah, I think it's, as I said, one of the most important developments in our field. And we really look forward to seeing how you, how your research develops and and how you make a contribution as an indigenous archaeologist. So, Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. And once again, we're, we're very grateful and we're grateful to everybody who uh, tuned in to the webinar tonight and for the support you've uh, given Crow Canyon uh, in this webinar series. So every Thursday, join us again next Thursday, please. And once again, thank you, Patrick. Yep. Thank you, everyone.